This is Internet Marketing. Hello and welcome to the Internet Marketing Podcast brought to you by Site Visibility. I'm your host, Scott Colduct, and today with me I have Saksham Sharda, Creative Director at Outgrow.co. And we're going to be talking about boosting user engagement with no-code interactive content. I'm really excited to talk about this topic. But before we get into the detail of this episode, Saksham, can you please introduce yourself to our listeners? Uh, Thanks for having me on the show, Scott. I specialize in data collection, analysis, uh, filtering of data, and also transfer of data uh, by the means of interactive widgets and applets and interactive interactive cultural and trending widgets designed by me have been featured on websites like Product Hunt, Trend Hunter, Flipboard, uh, Digimarcon, Silicon Valley, and at the European Affiliate Summit. Uh, I work for Outgrow.co, which enables marketers, it's a no-code tool that enables marketers to create interactive content like calculators, quizzes, recommendations, forms and surveys, uh, chatbots that you one can put on their website, polls, uh, contests, and also assessments. And these high converting, personalized, and viral experiences usually add real value to the customer, enable new levels of engagement, and generate helpful data that you can then use to qualify and segment your leads. That's a great introduction. Thank you. And you used the phrase no code, which I've also including it, included in today's episode title. And I'm fascinated by what I see as a rising no code movement. It's something that's been on my radar for a few years. But from my perspective, I feel like it's gaining real momentum as we're speaking today. So I'm curious to know from your perspective, has there been anything that's triggered this no code movement? Have there been any developments in the last few years which have accelerated the growth of this community and this movement? I think uh, it's like a it's a very common example that I use. Like when I was young, I my parents told me because I, I guess that was the time when you know softwares and computers were just taking off, and my parents told me that you, I have to learn coding. So they sent me in high school to a coding class, and I did terrible. I was I was terrible. I almost failed the other subjects. Like I was good at studies, but because of that class, my entire average went down. And since mm-hmm. then, I've not taken a shot at it at all. But what has happened is uh, I think a general realization amongst the tech community that coders are not the answer to everything. By which I mean, you will reach a stasis if all your creativity is coming from coders because coders are just good at coding. That does not necessarily mean that they are creative. And which is why I think there's a huge uh, movement towards no-code tools now because the point of the industry is to bring in people who have expertise in their different respective industries. So, you know, in the finance industry, of finance broker has expertise and he shouldn't be held back in in using his expertise uh, because he doesn't know how to code. And that is where no-code tools come. So tools like Outgrow allow you to do everything that a coder does or all the years he spent learning code and he can do. You can do all of that using tools like Outgrow and you can do it in a short amount of time like a weekend and you can put it on your website and you can take your business to the next level because the industry favors creativity than someone's knowledge of code. So that's why I think there's a huge shift towards no coding. And actually, for our listeners that aren't familiar with no code, the phrase, the businesses out there like yours that support the no code community and and the movement here, can you describe what it is that you do? So how do you create an environment where people can create all of these interactive forms of media, websites, assets? How do you do that without asking people to code? So it's basically like a drag and drop builder. So you just go and you place elements and you replace elements. So basically PowerPoint is another, it's like it's a PowerPoint too is a no code tool. It's just that we don't think of it as a no code tool because uh, because we've been just using it. We're just used to using it. So we think like, you know, uh, uh, it's like something else, but it's actually a no code tool that's allowing you to make presentations without actually having to type in code and, you know, make presentations. Uh, so basically what our no code tool outgrow allows you to do is that it lets you build eight fundamental 
kinds of experiences that make the inter- internet interactive. Uh, everything on the internet is interactive. Everything on the internet is like, you know, you ask a question and you give us something back. So that's like, for instance, Google. But uh, what it allows you to do, uh, our tool, is, al- it, is that it allows you to build eight different kinds of experiences, quizzes, calculators, polls, surveys, recommendations, assessments, and chatbots. And if you want to build something more complex, you can again use the drag and drop builder to combine any of these eight into a more complex widget or a more complex, you know, uh, recommendation. So it's totally possible to use no code tools to build any of this. Brilliant. And in this episode, we're going to be narrowing on the area of interactive content because there are no code apps and no other no code type services that you can build. But we're going to be speaking specifically about interactive content. And so as a starting point, I'm curious to know that from your perspective, what are the trends that you're seeing in the space of interactive content? So for example, is there one type of content, one type of format that's becoming really popular right now? I think it's like historically we can trace it like with BuzzFeed doing it. So initially BuzzFeed started off as a quiz making company. So you would see all these, you know, quizzes on your Facebook feed. And then eventually they realized uh, two things happening that when they, so quizzes were the old trend. Uh, They realized two things happening. A, that they were collecting a huge amount of data, which they could then use to market to people. So then next, when you go to BuzzFeed after taking a quiz, you see ads that are more relevant to you. And that is how BuzzFeed sells to you. And the uh, so that is the key thing that they realized through the quizzes. And B, they also realized that these are helpful. The quizzes are helpful in the sense that if I have a quiz like which career should you actually have or which Ivy League school you should go to, the the value I'm providing at the end, the result that I'm providing at the end, people are willing to enter their email for it or people are willing to like, you know, drop some sort of information for it. Or in case you're like selling a PDF or an ebook or like, you know, it's a really helpful piece of information, then you can even charge people money for it. So those gateways actually are the selling point at the end of the quiz. So these are the two things that were happening. And still a lot of businesses uh, use quizzes like across the board. But one of the recent things in which we have seen there's been a huge uh, uh, development of interactive content is just when the pandemic started, the coronavirus pandemic started, a lot of uh, restaurants had to move online because, uh, you know, uh, eating at the restaurants was forbidden. So uh, they had to like establish a website. If they didn't have any, they had to establish takeaway routes and everything. So we have seen a lot of people use interactive content to build uh, restaurant uh, owners have built uh, build your own burger menus or build your own pizza menus. So they just put a widget on their website that allows you to build your own pizza. And based on what you selected, like, you know, the toppings and everything, uh, it gives you a customized, you know, pricing at the end and it automates the whole takeaway process. And it also helps the restaurant because it's collecting uh, helpful data about, you know, what kind of topping people want so they can better their supply chain process. They can also remarket to these people with ads and other products. So it's totally possible to do all that. That's a fascinating insight. I hadn't thought about that too much, but thinking that through at the moment, there's probably a real drive as you've given the explanation or description of restaurants. Mm -hmm. But I imagine it's going to be a very similar thing for I don't know, Airbnb owners or hotel owners or anyone in hospitality because there are more considerations right now when you're booking a venue or a hospitality venue or a hotel than ever before. And that those changes in expectations, behaviors, and what you're looking for are going to mean that people are going to have to adapt their websites very quickly to allow for this level of customization that people are looking for right now. So I think that's really interesting. That's a really interesting insight and one that I hadn't really reflected on until you've just mentioned that. On the flip side of that, are there any content, interactive content trends that are declining? So things that maybe were popular a few years ago, but are becoming less popular? I would say uh, what has happened is, again, using the BuzzFeed example, because BuzzFeed has done it itself as well. Now, BuzzFeed has moved into like news reporting itself. So it's not making so many quizzes. And that's because the quiz trend started really huge. So it was really big. It was like a huge, uh, it created shockwaves in the market. But now what's happening, it's not that the quiz trend is declining, but because people have figured out that one kind of interactive content, that is a quiz, is really helpful 
they're trying to find out what other kinds of interactive content uh, pieces are helpful. So it's not that the quiz trend is declining, it's just not growing as fast as the other seven kinds of interactive content trends. So, you know, contests are taking off really big. And okay, I'll give you so so the eight content types that I told you, uh, you know, calculators, quizzes, contests, chatbots, uh, assessments, forms and surveys. Uh, you can just go on our website and you can see the eight. But what I'm trying to say is that uh, quizzes were trying to take off and now they're not. But uh, contests, for instance, are taking off now because uh, because again, because of the coronavirus, all the big companies like, you know, Macy's and Target and others, Walmart, uh, they're not having physical Black Friday uh, shopping events. So, you know, people are not going to stores to buy stuff because, you know, because of the virus spreading. So there's danger of that. Instead, they're competing for online marketing space. So so a company like Walmart has to compete with a small and medium-sized business for Google advertising space. And so, you know, it's it's leveling the playing field. And to get ahead of these companies, the, there's two things that we've noticed that a lot of businesses are doing is that they're A, using contests and B, they're using e-commerce recommendations. So contests just allow people to like, you know, you give away one thing, you give away one product, product like a shirt and you generate a lot of engagement for some 50,000 people who are uh, competing to get the shirt. So or like an Xbox or like, you know, you just give away one product and there are 50,000 people competing, talking about you, talking about your brand. And that generates a lot of uh, advertising and marketing space. And B, the other thing people are using is e-commerce recommendations, uh, which basically ask you a couple of questions. And uh, so instance, for instance, when you walk into a mall, uh, you walk into a sunglasses shop, there's a shop assistant who asks you a couple of questions, who's knowledgeable about the field and can tell you what kind of sunglasses you should get, uh, you know, based on your uh, face shape or like, you know, your hairstyle, et cetera, et cetera. So you can have people are using those e-commerce recommendations to to recommend products which have a personalized uh, significance to the user. And uh, that way they're able to put their product in front of the users against a lot of competitors. So these are the two things people are using. Yeah, and, and that also leads back to that element of, I guess, customization and a difference in behavior right now is that you don't have that face-to-face -face store experience. And mm -hmm. so you might want an enhanced customer service experience online. I remember, I can't remember the name that you give it, but I remember ex experimenting with one of the chatbot tools that's on your website to gain some experience of how that works in practice. And you know, a lot of people listening to this podcast are quite, quite familiar at this point, I assume, with chatbot experiences, but your, co your no-code tools allow people to build those very quickly to guide people, particularly for e-commerce sites, in the right direction of products that will be of interest to them. So I thought that was really um, particularly useful. And on this topic about just building products and you talking about trends in products, I am interested to know, are there any trends or insights that you found through using your own products in your own marketing? Or to summarize, what have you used from your own tool base that has worked well for you? Uh, we've used our own chatbot products. So the chatbot that you see on our own website is from Outgrow itself. So it was really easy for us to build. And there are like now more than like, I think, 40 or 50 different chatbot templates on our website that anyone can just customize in a in a like you know in a jiffy so it's totally possible to do that and we've also used like you know so when i bring up this whole idea of interactive content on this podcast it can be overwhelming for some people and they go on a website and they don't know where to start so the whole onboarding process is in the form of a quiz so it asks you a couple of questions and then it puts you exactly where you need to start from so that entire process is interactive and then finally we've built uh, an idea generator that asks you a couple of questions like, you know, your industry, how many employees you have, uh, you know, and a couple of other questions. And then it recommends what kind of interactive content you need to be building on your website right now. So it just simplifies things because I think nowadays there's just too much information, too much happening online and there's too much noise. And to cut through that, you need to just ask a couple of questions to your prospective user and just recommend them something because making the decision process easier for them is like meeting them halfway. That's a great transition into what I wanted to talk about anyway, which is the knowing where to start. So you've talked a little bit about there about resources that are available via your website to help you validate and really research your ideas for the first time and to help you get started. 
But are there, are there any other pieces of advice or tips that you would provide to marketers out there, marketers that might have an idea in mind about the content that they create or might not know what their audience like? How can they find out what is most likely to engage their audience in terms of interactive content? I think what we have seen uh, for the most part, I think what anyone should do, I think these are the first three simple steps. Uh, go to our website, uh, go to the template section and then just look up trending templates. Or if you don't want to follow the trend, then just uh, look up search by industry. So it's just in the drop down menu. When you click on that, it will show you more than a thousand templates that have been sorted by industry. And that once you end up on that page, uh, you all you need to do is just sort it by industry and then just see which of these templates fits you. Sign up for a seven day trial. If one of these templates works for you, then just use it. If it doesn't work for you, it's a seven day trial. So you it all automatically expires and you don't have to worry about it. But the point is, it will only take you an hour maximum to like adapt this template and put it on your website. And it would take you a day to actually test whether it's actually working. So make it five days and test it out. So it's totally possible to just pick one of those templates and go ahead with that. And specifically focusing on quizzes and calculators, I know there are lots of different interactive content types that you can create using Outgrow, but I'm interested to know when it comes to calculators and quizzes, which you've talked about as being particularly popular. So it doesn't take long to create a quiz, but are there specific questions that you can ask in a quiz and specific tips that you'd recommend to help make a quiz or a calculator more engaging? I think in general, you should limit it to less than 10 questions because more than 10 questions and it feels like a form and that should never be. You're going to start losing out people at every question. And you you can actually track that in our very powerful analytics section. So you, you go to our website, take a template, put it on your website and... You say it has 10 questions and you notice in the Outgrow analytic, analytics section that after the fourth question, you would see a significant drop of the number of people who finished the quiz. So then you can reduce the number of questions. And so that is one thing you can do. B, you can add like GIFs. Uh, there's like a whole variety of GIFs that are available. Uh, we integrate with so many softwares. You can make it interesting, you know, so that it's not just a form, but it seems like, you know, an intelligent uh, software that's interacting with someone. And uh, so these are the two things that I would say, but for calculators specifically, and again, like also for quizzes, is that the key thing you have to remember is that I can tell you, like, I can give you like standard uh, generalized answers about like, you know, across all industries, what works. But specifically, I think you would have, anyone who's listening would have specific knowledge in their industry and they should like mold the GIF, uh, sorry, the quiz or something to their uh, particular industry's expectations. So if you're seeing a lot of drop after like the fourth question, it can just be four questions long and you would know the key four questions to ask to be able to recommend something of value. I'm quite sure you'd be able to do that in four questions. So there's that and be uh the idea matters a lot. So uh, we have had like one uh, lawyer who used on his website a very untraditional uh, widget, which was basically, it said, see how much I can save you in legal fees. So this calculator would ask a couple of questions. And then based on that, it would show in a graph over time, how much money the company would save by employing this legal service to work with them. So, you know, if you have expertise in your particular field, I'm quite sure once you enter the builder and you're not encumbered by code, you would be able to experiment as much as you like and you'd be able to come up with good ideas and good optimization on your own. And you just provided a good example from a lawyer there. Speaking more generally, mm -hmm. are there any interactive content examples that have come to mind for you recently that you've seen being in this space that have really engaged you and that you love? Uh, well, usually like as a creative director, I'm just following uh, a lot of trends. So one of the things that I've seen is, is that the virus itself has become like a thing that people are constantly talking about. And there's a lot of misinformation about the virus. So we had an NGO that worked with us and uh, created a calculator that basically shows people their risk of dying from coronavirus. And how does this risk compare to the risk of other, like, you know, other ailments, like, you know, other viruses or like, you know, other car accidents or stuff like that. So they took a lot of data from, because uh, it's publicly available data from John Hopkins and uh, a lot of other 
sources. And they made this calculator and it was, it really went viral because they were able to show that, you know, the risk is this much and this is how it compares to other risks. So I think that is one way of definitely driving engagement. And again, like, you know, the restaurant takeaway, it again happened because of the virus. But I think the key thing to remember is that whatever industry your listeners are in, they can provide something to help people in this situation, in these times. The industry probably has an answer to that. And interactive content will just bring them a step closer to helping people out. And when it comes to the topic of, uh, I think you talked about going viral there. So you can create great content and that's one thing, but attracting people to that content. So the marketing aspect of that interactive content, is that something you get involved with an outgrow? And do you have any tips or advice on what it takes to promote a good quiz or a good calculator? Any platforms that you prefer promoting those interactive content formats on? So uh, I think uh, we in, in the Outgrow Analytics section, there's definitely a section for performance that has a huge checklist of things that you need to be doing in order to promote your particular interactive content piece. So once you make your content piece, you just go through that checklist, like, you know, have you shared it in like Facebook groups, LinkedIn groups, you know, all of these places, or have you shared it? Uh, have you commented with it under articles in newspapers? Like, you know, if you find an article that's relevant, you just comment under it saying, okay, this can help you out. Except for that, there's a lot of websites like producthunt.com, uh, where, which has a monthly uh, visitor count of like 6 million people. And uh, usually these people are looking for products, but uh, when you post an interactive widget, like, you know, uh, see which sunglasses you should buy or like, you know, see how much I can sell, like, you know, a uh, uh, any kind of widget that is related to product selection. For instance, recently we posted something like which VR virtual reality set should you get? Uh, so it's a quiz. It's a simple quiz that guides you through the process and then recommends a VR set that is very relevant for you. So you can post it there because there'll always be an audience there for stuff like this. And uh, I think all in all, these are the key ways in which you can promote it. But we have also seen a lot of clients and companies advertise using it. So you can put these as Google advertisements and Facebook advertisements. And finally, we've also seen a lot of companies just put it on the website and it just, it just goes viral from the website directly. And that's actually how Outgrow came about to be because uh, there was this company that was manufacturing or that was helping people make mobile apps. And they'd put a calculator on their uh, website that said, uh, you know, uh, see how much it would cost you to put an app on the app store, uh, you know, and we'll make the app for you. So it will ask a couple of questions like where you want your developer team, et cetera, et cetera. And then it generated so many leads. It like people just started going to that website to find out how much it's going to cost them to make an app. And uh, so that's one way it can go viral. And I've also seen quizzes, calculators and interactive content promoted a lot through content discovery networks such as Taboola and Outbrain. Is that something you see a lot of too? And do you see that working frequently in your area? Yeah, for sure. We've seen like people use all sorts of tools, including uh, SparkToro. I don't know whether you've heard of that as well. So uh, they actually allow you to just find out where you would find the ideal audience for your content. And based on that, you can then target that ideal audience by just pasting this. So yeah, we've seen people use a whole lot of tools to do this. In a closing for this episode today, I'm really interested in the aspect of psychology when it comes to quizzes, calculators, and interactive content. But quizzes in particular, why do you think quizzes are so engaging? And I remember seeing, I'll try and link to this in the show notes, but I think it was on your website, it really struck me that I think the number one article on New York Times, at least when the video was created on, created on your website, ever, was a quiz. So it wasn't an article at all. And I remember reading something along the lines of six out of the top 10 most popular articles on BuzzFeed were mm -hmm. all quiz related. And that fascinated me as well. Is that, what do you think it is? And do you have any resources or ideas or thoughts that you could share with our listeners about why quizzes in particular are so engaging? Hmm, That's a deep one. I think it's uh, because it takes care of a very fundamental human need, which is to question everything. And I think that's what quizzes kind of uh, preempt and then deliver. Uh, but what I would like to talk about specifically in relation to this is because we are living in the information age and uh, the, the official 
age the classification for this is the information age but a lot of people say that we're living in the late part of the information age the disinformation or the misinformation age uh, i was on a podcast with the co-founder of wikipedia who actually used this phrase and uh, the key thing was that uh, there's just too much information out there like there's too much information misinformation and disinformation and so how do you actually get to the user and how do you like you know make a website uh, that actually attracts the user when he has a billion other competitors of yours to choose from and the way to reach further towards the user to like reach him 50% and like you know to make it work from both sides is by making a quiz where the user answers a couple of questions and then you open the right door for the user you show him the right way and that helps them break a decision paralysis a choice paralysis and it really helps them make a choice and i think that is the key reason why we have seen interactive content take off so much that's really interesting. A really interesting way to look at it is that the age of misinformation could be leading people towards finding essentially more unique, more bespoke content that very, very specifically suits what they're looking for. Mm. And so quizzes are a step-by-step process to help you cut through the noise and allow you that pathway to find exactly what it is that you're looking for. So that um, even though it might have been a deep question, uh, that question, you've just answered that really well. That's given me a really unique angle to look at that from. So thanks for that. But um, before I let you go today and in closing this episode, is there, are there any other thoughts, ideas or resources that you want to share with our listeners about how to get started with creating no-code interactive content? And also, do you want to share details of where our listeners can find you? Uh, So I think the first step, and because I don't want to complicate it too much, is the easiest way is to just go on our website, look up the template section, and then just pick a template. You'll have a seven-day free trial in which you can try out the template and see if it works or not. And, you know, Black Friday is coming up, so this is the ideal time for you to experiment online with interactive content because in recent memory and maybe like forever, like this might be the only year in which small and medium-sized businesses will have a great opportunity to compete with enterprises for the same marketing space online because enterprises do not have their physical stores available because of the coronavirus. So do that, go on our website, use the templates, check them out. And B, if you want to claim a discount that's longer than seven days, then you can just go to https uh, forward slash forward slash outgrow.co slash site visibility, site visibility. And uh, you'll be able to claim a 20% discount on annual plans and a 30 day long free trial. So you can actually experiment for a longer time. Uh, This is a Black Friday discount. So do do make sure you use it before Black Friday. Brilliant. Hey, thank you so much for your time. That's been a really interesting episode and I'd encourage everyone to go check out your website and get started with the free trial and just experiment with interactive content, particularly around this Black Friday. Um, There's plenty of reason to do so. And as uh, Saksham, you've shared in this episode, there are lots of unique ways in which interactive content is um, being used, particularly in this era era that we're living in right now. So thanks so much for sharing that. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. Take care. Bye-bye. 